Thanks, Ed. And I'd like to thank the societies for hosting the event and um, Kieran and the other organisers. Thank you. Thanks also for everybody for coming tonight. And it's good to see some children in the audience, like kids. I'm going to ask a question at the end. If you get it right, or the first kid to put their hand up and get it right, I'll buy you a muffin. So you'll have to concentrate. You're not allowed to ask your parents. Tonight, I'd like to talk about decade to decade changes in climate. So we heard Darren talk about year to year changes in climate. Uh, and we heard Carl talk about longer term changes in climate. But I want to concentrate on decade to decade and generation to generation changes and also look more towards the future rather than just the past. And we heard tropical cyclone Yassi mentioned. This is a severe tropical cyclone. And here we see a picture of some of the aftermath of tropical cyclones, some very expensive debris in Hinchinbrook Marina. But of course, those of us with grey hair, perhaps a bit older than me, but anyway, will know back in 1918, for example, we saw severe tropical cyclones coming through Queensland, um, in this case in Innisfail, which pretty much destroyed the town. There were 3,500 3, residents at the time, and many houses, of course, and only 12 houses remained intact after that event. And that, unfortunately, resulted in approximately 75 to 100 uh, deaths. And another one, I mean, Brisbane floods have been in the news, but this photo goes back to 1893. This is, again, the aftermath of a tropical cyclone, uh, and this resulted in 23 deaths. And so what I've done with a colleague of mine in, called, uh, named Jeff Callaghan in Queensland is to go back looking at all historical records that we could lay our hands on using newspapers, uh, archives from um, the Bureau of Meteorology, research papers, historical societies, public information, and tried to come up with a reliable estimate of what's happened over the past 140 years to tropical cyclones, severe tropical cyclones, making landfall in the 1,600 kilometre strip indicated in the plot between Cairns and Ballina in northern New South Wales. And lo and behold, what you find is that there's very large decade to decade changes, or 10 year changes, one 10 year period to the next 10 year period, in the number of severe tropical cyclones making landfall. So you can see in recent periods, there were very relatively few tropical cyclones coming through, which may surprise people because, you know, we've had tropical cyclones in the news of late, but actually it's been a quite a quiet period. And if you compare it to previous periods, like in the early 1900s, we had seven tropical cyclones coming through in, in particular 10-year periods, whereas in recent times, as I said, there weren't any at all. So you can see that there's an enormous amount of decade-to-decade or decadal changes in the number of tropical cyclones coming through. And this is a common feature of the climate system. It doesn't really matter where you look, it's the same, that there are these large decadal or generational changes. So what you see in one generation isn't necessarily what you'll see in the following generation. So here's another example, and this, is, this, alludes, uh, this refers back to what Darren was talking about, something called the Walker Circulation. The Walker Circulation is one of the largest and most important atmospheric wind systems over the whole planet. The lower limb of the Walker circulation are the very famous trade winds associated with exploration over the last three or four centuries. And um, what we can do is we can, we can track the strength of that Walker circulation using the Southern Oscillation Index, which is a measure of the pressure difference between Tahiti and Darwin across the Pacific Ocean. And in some, these are, what I show here is from 1900 through to quite recently, 30-year running averages of this index. So basically it's a measure of how strong the walker circulation is. And you can see that in some 30-year periods it was very strong, whereas in more recent times it's become quite weak. And one of the reasons for this, as Carl mentioned, was that in some 30-year periods you tend to get more El Ninos than La Ninas. During El Ninos the walker circulation tends to weaken, and during La Ninas the walker circulation tends to strengthen. And when the walker circulation weakens, Australia tends to get droughts, India tends to get drought, and in fact, the person who pioneered a lot of this work, Walker, was, most, was primarily concerned about famines coming to India every now and then in association with what we now call El Nino events. So that's just another example of very important decade to decade generational changes in the climate system. And it's interesting that you can actually link these two things together because what we found in this study, and it's been um, seen in much shorter periods in earlier studies, 
is that during El Ninos, the number of tropical cyclones in the Australian region tends to decline. And during La Nina, what we're in at the moment, the number of tropical cyclones tends to increase. And what we find is that if we look at 10, 10 year changes in this measure of the Walker circulation, the SOI, and 10 year changes in the number of tropical cyclones making landfall, there's a, a link between those two things. And again, that's driven by decadal changes in the frequency of El Nino and decadal changes in the frequency of La Nina. So as I said, there's, there's a, pretty much wherever you look in the climate system, you'll see these generational decadal changes. And of course, that's just from the historical record. If you can go back even further, hundreds of thousands of years ago, um, you see these very large natural changes in the climate system. It's fundamentally important. Natural variability is fundamentally important to the climate system. Not just year to year, not just decade to decade, not just generation to generation, but even from 100,000 year period to the next. So what this time series shows is a concentration, the atmospheric concentration of carbon dioxide and starting from near present on the left hand side of the plot where you see that big spike upwards and then as you go towards the right you're moving further back in time, hundreds of thousands of years ago. And this is known because of very clever work by scientists who drill holes in ice cores in uh, Antarctica and they then analyse the air bubbles trapped in the ice. And so they're able to deduce that there's been these very large natural changes in the concentration of carbon dioxide, a greenhouse gas. And that inset shows what's happened over the last 1,000 years. You can see that it was fairly flat until we get past the 1800s. And that's because of human activity. Humans have been largely responsible for that very large, rapid, on geological timescales, large rapid increase in the concentration of carbon dioxide. Now, Carl showed that the world has warmed up in our historical records, and I've just shown that the concentration of greenhouse gases has increased abruptly to levels that haven't been seen for many hundreds of thousands of years. So why is it that scientists now put these two things together? And the answer is because of the greenhouse effect. So we know, for example, let me just explain very briefly what the greenhouse effect is. If we suppose that this is the surface of the Earth, the sun, radiation from the sun beats down, hits the surface of the Earth, it's absorbed and it warms up. Everything that warms up gives off what's called long wave radiation. We're all giving off long wave radiation. And it will then, the surface of the Earth will then warm up and it will give off long wave radiation. And some of that will pass through the atmosphere into outer space, which is good because it cools the planet off. But some of it is absorbed by greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. Carbon dioxide is one, water vapour is another. And then the atmosphere itself warms up, and so it too gives off long wave radiation. Some of that long wave radiation from the atmosphere goes into outer space, but unfortunately, in some respects, it, some of it comes back down to the surface of the Earth. So the surface of the Earth sees two sources of heat direct radiation from the sun and long wave radiation from the atmosphere. And what humans have been doing is increasing that effect. So the Earth is getting this double whammy and that second whammy from the long wave radiation is now packing a stronger punch than it used to. Now of course that's a very simple model and to actually quantify how large the temperature change would be in response to that larger amount of long wave radiation coming down is not a simple task. You need to take into account the fact that there are oceans, there's sea ice, there's clouds, all of thing, these things are fundamentally important to the climate system. And fortunately, over the last 50, 40, 50 years, physicists, mathematicians, computer scientists have developed very complex mathematical models which encapsulate the <coughs> physics of the climate system. And these things have mathematical equations for cloud formation, for rainfall, for winds, for ocean currents, for sea ice, for example. And here's uh, some of the uh, equations that are, that are inside that climate model uh, depicted here. This is just a very small subset of the equations. This is just some of the equations used to simulate the variability in the ocean. So it doesn't, if you start putting the equations down for the atmosphere and the links between them, they become horrendously complicated. But one interesting thing you can do with these models is you can then increase the amount of greenhouse gases, the increase the concentration of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, and you let the physics and the mathematics tell you what the response is. So you, you sit back and you let the mathematics do the job. And what you find 
is that um, there are a number of time series here from approximately 1900 through to the year 2000. The black, let's concentrate on the lower middle panel, global land. The story is similar in all of the plots. There are two, the black line is the observed changes that we've seen, a 10 year running average of global land temperature over the 20th century. The blue line is what happens from lots of different climate models from around the world, 20 or so, if you don't include forcing from greenhouse gases. Notice that it's not flat, and that's because of very important natural processes like changes in the output from the sun and changes in volcanic activity. But the only way our climate models can simulate this rapid increase in the observed temperature is if we put in increases in greenhouse gases. That's the pink ribbon. The other thing you can do with these models is you can project what might happen in the future given a scenario about what greenhouse gas concentrations will be in the atmosphere. And what this shows is a series of time series, the observations on the left from 1900 through to the year 2000. The vertical axis is the global surface temperature. And you can see that the world has warmed up, as I've said before, as Carl said. But then we get into the future, when this was done anyway, from the year 2000 onwards. And there are a whole host of possibilities. The lowest possibility here, the gold or rusty coloured one down the bottom, is what happens if we were somehow magically able to go back to the year 2000 and freeze greenhouse gas levels at that, 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 that occurred at that time. Obviously we can't do that, but what it's, interesting, what it's interesting here is that the world still continues to warm up, even if we're able to do that. And that's because the forcing that's been applied in the past hasn't fully been taken up by the, the climate system. So the climate system hasn't fully responded to the forcing that's already occurred. So some future warming and some future sea level rise is inevitable, no matter what we do with our future emissions. Of course, the, f the fact is that we've already been emitting lots more greenhouse gases since the year 2000, and projections are that we're going to be emitting a lot more into the future. What happens um, in the future towards the end of the 21st century will depend critically upon what decisions we make, the world makes over the next 10, 20, 30 years, what we do with our emissions. If we aren't able to, if the global community isn't able to rein in its uh, greenhouse gas emissions, then these most serious projections, the larger temperature changes, are much more likely to occur. Now the other thing you can do with these models is not just project temperature and um, sea level, you can also project rainfall. And what these shows are projections just for the year 2030, which is only 19 years away. And this is just the component due to greenhouse, uh, to greenhouse gas forcing. And there are four panels here which show predict, projected pro rainfall changes as a percentage. One for winter, one for summer, one for spring and one for autumn. And you can see that the left hand plots have measles. These measles indicate that there's strong agreement amongst the models on, what, on the fact that the projection is of one sign. So the rusty colours here indicate that there's a drying trend during winter and during spring, as do the reds. And the reds are the largest values. And so you can see that South Australia and Western Australia um, seem to be the states which will exhibit the largest declines, percentage declines in rainfall. During summer and autumn, the models don't tend to agree. There's no strong consensus amongst the models, but there is during winter and during spring. And the percentage changes vary from something like 5 to 10 per cent over in the west and probably 3 to 5 over in the east by 2030. And as time goes on, of course, these numbers get much, much larger, assuming that we aren't able to rein in our greenhouse gas emissions. Now, one of the points that Darren made was that our climate now and the climate in the future will be a product of two things. This very, very important natural variability which has always been here and always will be here. But now we've got this new thing we have to worry about, which is human forced climate change. And what this shows is a time series, or various time series, of the strength of the walker circulation. So I just want to use this as an example of the broader climate system. And what it shows is the observations, the black line, 30 year running averages of the strength of the walker circulation from around about 1920 through to the year 2080, 70 years time. Um, but the observations cut out um, before the year 2000. 
And again, these are 30-year running averages. So you can see that there's lots of variability and there's also been a weak downward trend. The red line is what the models tell us will happen to the Walker circulation strength in response to increases in greenhouse gases and other forcing uh, mechanisms. And those rusty lines on either side of the red line is just a measure of the uncertainty we have in our ability to estimate the greenhouse gas effect. And the pink line is fundamentally important. The pink line is the natural variability. We could end up in the future, let's look at 2080, we could end up anywhere in that pink line. Where we end up will be a function of the greenhouse gas forcing and the natural variability, which we don't know what it will do. It may exacerbate the impact of greenhouse gases or it may offset it. We may be lucky and it may offset it for that particular period. So that pink really uh, indicates the envelope of uncertainty of where we're going. Now this is just for the strength of the Walker circulation. I could have done this for any other variable in the climate system and it's a similar story. The relative size of that pink envelope will change. Some, for some variables it's smaller, like global temperature it's much smaller. For rainfall at a particular location it's going to be larger. Natural variability plays a relatively more important role for local rainfall compared to this Walker circulation. But the same message is true. Where we end up will, won't be a function of just natural variability. It won't be a function of just greenhouse gas forcing. It'll be a function of those two things put together. And our ability to predict it in any given year, well out into that 20, 21st century, is very, diffi very difficult. No one knows how to predict natural variations that far ahead. In fact, we're not even sure it's physically possible to do it. Although the world is now, international community, is now trying to um, predict decadal changes, but those systems are only now being developed. There's um, no guarantee of success, but it is a major international effort. So in summary then, we've seen that climate in Australia, climate around the world varies from year to year, decade to decade, generation to generation. Much of that is natural variability due to natural processes. And the evidence thus far that we can predict that natural vari variability beyond, let's say, a year is very limited. Who knows what clever people in 20 years' time will be able to do, but at this point in time, it doesn't look promising that we can predict a lot of this natural variability. Um, and humans are now having an influence on our climate system and clearly that's not a gen in general that's not a very good thing but if you're interested in being able to predict the future it's actually good news because you can say well the decades ahead are more likely to be warmer than the decades of the past. Rainfall over the next 20 years is more likely to be lower than the 20th century average than higher than the 20th century average. So you've got this predictive capability. You don't really want to have it, but you've got it. And, as, and the point that I've made several times already, you know, our future climate depends on both natural variability and human forcing. And finally, that the extent to which that greenhouse gas component will influence us in the future will depend critically upon what uh, decisions the global community makes about its emissions. So thank you very much. Thank you.